Hello everyone, I'm Kim Seebecker, Certification Manager at CSIA. I want to thank you for attending this month's CSI webinar. Today we're going to be talking about best practices, cert CSI certification, and the certification audit experience. As a reminder, if you have questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A box to the right of your screen, not the chat box. This program, like many of our webinars, will be archived on controlsys.org, typically within 24 hours of the broadcast. First, we would like to thank John Weber, Monica Anderson, and the whole team at Software Toolbox for hosting and sponsoring our monthly webinars. Software Toolbox was created in 1996 to rid the industry of bad third-party software experiences. They do this per by providing a variety of industrial automation software tools and applications, the knowledge of how they work together or with other automation software to deliver end user value, and a responsive, proven support process all focused on lowering risk. Find them on the web at softwaretoolbox.com. <clears throat> so to begin today, I would like to just remind everyone that this session is, is intended for general informational purposes only. Panelists will not answer company-specific questions, and participation in this webinar in no way guarantees a successful audit. We're pretty excited about the panelists we've got lined up today that have volunteered to speak with you. We have Gordon Cox from American Systems Registrar. Brian Mullen from Exitec, Jody Poiré from Hargrove Controls and Automation, Don Roberts from Exitec, Eric Schaefer from Stone Technologies, Inc. Um, Eric is also chairman of the CSI Best Practices Committee. Um, we also were going to be joined by Tom Salda from American Systems Registrar, but unfortunately he was unable to join us today. So to jump right in, one of the questions we get quite often is what is the value of CSI certification? Jody, would you like to comment on that? Sure, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Jody Poyer, and I'm leader of projects at Hargrove CNA. And um, I guess I'm, I'm um, pretty happy to where we are right now based upon uh, us going through the audit in May uh, 27, 2017. Uh, we prepared for this audit for about six to eight months before uh, the May audit process, and the big goal was to, you know, get our company uh, standardized and get up to um, some standards that uh, would would allow us to be uh, better um, for our clients and, and their work processes, and overall just make us a better company. Um, some of the values that we found from um, going through this audit process and, and, and being um, a CSIA representative um, was one of the main things was that clients look at this and they are able to see that, you know, we've made a commitment to uh, going through this process and, you know, trying to uh, make our organization more efficient. Um, we had some company, and po company policies in place uh, before we went through this audit, but going through the best practices beforehand, we were able to take those policies and they basically organize them um, into a coherent system that we that everybody now follows with our, our company. Um, some of the things that we've seen um, from going through this process, uh, one of the big things is, you know, as I said, the clients appreciate uh, that we have this organization. Um, another item is the margins. Margins have increased due to our standardized processes um, and the efficiencies that came out of this process. Uh, teammates now have a roadmap to um, creating projects and running projects through a process um, that we put in place, again, based off our company policies um, and then refining those policies to meet our, the best practices of CSIA. Um, <clears throat> so, the, the other big item that we've seen is quality has been increased on these projects as well. Um, you know, having a roadmap and how, how we uh, accomplish and run these projects, uh, the teammates here are not um, in, in the dark a lot of times on how these things run. They can look at these policies. They're all written down. They understand and everybody's held to the same standards. Uh, they understand how a project should run and how it should run um, uh, effectively. Um, 
The other big item is uh, we've seen the risk that's been reduced um, for our clients and for our company. Um, by you know running through these procedures, you know we can see what's coming um, and and apply that to different types of projects and the risks that are involved in those projects. Um, so it's it's been a very very valuable experience. Uh, you know we we gained a lot from this. Um, to talk about the audit just a little bit, uh, it was a, a rigorous process process that. You know, when you start this, you kind of look at internally and look at what you're doing with uh, how you're running your company before you run through this. You just start immediately seeing all the areas of improvement that you can um, put forth in the company to um, increase the, the value that you offer to your clients. Um, the eight months that we took to get ready for this, um, it, it you know, there, there was a lot of times we were kind of looking at these best practices and, you know, kind of saying, oh my gosh, you know, there's a lot to think about. But, you know, once you kind of get over uh, being overwhelmed at the beginning, you kind of start seeing um, how everything kind of fits together and pieced together. And, and what it does is it, you know, allows you to kind of cohe uh, become cohesive around these standards. Um, so we really had to understand and think about our processes and think about our procedures. Um, just give you a little background about the company. We, uh, we were here located in Mobile, Alabama, um, and we are the headquarters for the rest of our offices, uh, which we have 13 offices uh, located throughout the southeast. So we did our Mobile office in May, and then we have a plan to do another office every six to eight months um, throughout, you know, throughout to get them up to the certification process. And that doesn't mean they aren't following the CSI uh, best practices right now and our company um, policies right now. It just means that they, they each have to go through the audit process on their own. Um, and I have a, about a minute or two left. Um, some of the big things that came out of this, uh, this process was we were able to create these flows, um, such as like a new project creation flow and how projects progress from being a proposal to uh, an actual project and all the things that you need to do to get that project going and started off right um, as, as, it's, uh, as it's moving along into you know, the active work as the project is progressing. And then also we uh, were able to create a new proposal flow as well. Um, and how we write our proposals, what we need to put in these proposals uh, to make sure that we have all our, all our bases covered, um, that we're protecting the client and that we're also protecting ourselves um, and, and how we're writing these. Um, these are just two of the main ones um, that we came up with, and these are automated. We have them automated through a, a system here um, at our company. Um, but, but these are the two main ones that have come out of it. Um, and what we're seeing is we're seeing as we you know do daily work and we go for our daily work, uh, uh, processes, we can see continuous improvement and we are putting together new um, enhancements and improvements uh, pretty much on a daily basis um, and building new flows to make sure that um, we're doing what we need to to maintain best practices um, within CSIA and also our company. So pretty much overall, we had an extremely good experience. Um, Kind of the big thing, the big takeaway is it kind of lets you look into yourself and look into the, the guts of an organization and, and see that you're not doing everything you can to make it better. And, and by following these best practices, uh, you're able to make those changes and um, a lot of good things come out of it. So I think that's about all I have to say about the value. Um, does anybody have any questions or do we just move on to the next uh, speaker? Um, we'll move on to the next question and the next speaker. Um, and then if, if anyone has questions for Jody, we can certainly take those at the end. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Another question we get a lot is, are there general tips, resources, and or tools to help with audit preparation? Brian, could you comment? Sure. So th this is Brian Mullen. Uh, I'm one of the auditors with uh, Exotech. And uh, yeah, so just want to spend a few minutes here to talk about uh, some thoughts, insights with regards to uh, audit preparation itself and uh, some of the things that are available to you. Uh, so at this point, uh, you know, this is really geared towards uh, companies that are going through this probably for the first time 
But uh, a lot of things that I talk about here are also very relevant for companies that are going through it for a second, third, or fourth time, uh, or at least they'll be uh, good reminders. Uh, so at, at this point, you know, you've decided or you're almost decided that you want to proceed going forward with implementing best practices and obtaining certification. Uh, some key things to keep in mind uh, right out of the gates is, you know, ensure that uh, senior management support is in place and is visible. You know, this is, this is really key to ensure that uh, you're going to get uh, the right kind of traction uh, throughout the process. Uh, let us know, uh, CSIA, the auditors, that you want to pursue implementing best practices and uh, proceeding with an audit. Um, you know, let us know early in the process. Uh, you know, don't start working in a closet. It's really helpful to, uh, you know, to get us engaged early on and uh, to you know, offer just some insights and uh, you know, clarify uh, different aspects of the process. Uh, confirm your eligibility with CSIA. Um, you know, by giving them a call, you know, give Kim a call. Uh, it doesn't uh, commit you to an audit, doing an audit tomorrow or anything. But what it does do is, uh, like I say, offer some uh, additional insights as to the process itself and some of the things that we're talking about here today. Uh, talk to an auditor early in the process um, and to try and clear up any general questions or concerns or possible misconceptions that you may have about the process or the audit itself. Um, so you want to give some thought if you have more than one office uh, as to which offices you may want to engage for certification. You know, typically, most folks just start off with their head office, but you may also be thinking that, well, we've got several offices, you know, so what, is, what do we need to do here or what can we do? And uh, we can certainly offer some, uh, some insight on that. Um, another helpful thing to do is refer to the CSIA website. You know, there's a best practices section uh, on the website and uh, you know, review it for uh, general information regarding you know, frequently asked questions. There's a section in there in a little video uh, for, you know, regarding some basic steps to certification. And uh, you know, these are all just good things to kind of get the ball rolling and to help get you past the I don't know what I don't know uh, aspects of uh, proceeding uh, doing an audit and getting certification if, you, if you've not done it before. Um, one of the uh, things, one of the questions that we often get uh, coming right out of the gates from folks that have never done this is how long does it take to prepare? Um, you know, the, the real answer to that question is it depends on where you're starting from. You know, we've seen companies you know, take from you know, a few weeks to you know, just kind of get some get things tizzied up and uh, you know, uh, in place to companies that you know, really need to go back to more of a grassroots start and you know, they take months or in some cases uh, you know, uh, few years to before they feel they're actually ready to start looking at doing an audit. So it, it varies a lot and uh, you know if you've got some questions as to where you think you're at in that process and it comes to getting ready, again give us a call. We can uh, share some insights as to um, you know what where you where that might be. So you know beyond this, you know, you want to get started. Uh, one of the first things to keep in mind is that you don't have to fly solo on this. You know, if there is help available you want to get your support systems in place. So when you kind of get the initial material and you look at best practices and you're doing this for the first time, uh, you know, get back to like Jody said previously, you know, it can seem overwhelming. You know, so so how do you eat the elephant? And there's different things you can do here. So one is well, talk with your peers, um, folks that have been through this before, once, twice, number of times. Uh, they're uh, great resources and they're usually more than willing to share, you know, some of their, their insights, good, bad, and indifferent about the whole process, and uh, you know, this is very, very valuable. Beyond just talking with your peers, there's the opportunity to actually try and get someone specific to help mentor you through the process. If you go to the CSIA website, there's a section in there on mentors and a facility to uh, uh, step you through helping you to find a mentor. If you're uncomfortable with that approach, you can always, uh, you know, just call up an auditor, and uh, you know, we've got some pretty good insights as to the folks that are out there as well, and uh, we may be able to offer some suggestions as, uh, as to a company that may be complementary and uh, would be willing to uh, support you uh, in a mentor type of role. Uh, another step you can take is, you know, sign up for the best practices workshop at the CSIA conference. I don't mean this to really sound like a plug for that per se. But it is a very good process. You know, we've been uh, engaged working with CSIA doing training. Uh, uh, actually, all the auditors have uh, provided training uh, for 
members uh, over you know, close to 12 years now at various points along the way. The most recent version is uh, there's a workshop tied in with the conference itself, so it's very convenient to uh, uh, get, get stitched in on that. You can certainly call CSIA if you uh, need more information on that. Um, another approach you can take here is engage in a pre-audit and get some form of uh, pre-audit support uh, with, with the auditor. And there's various flavors that can take in terms of on-site, remote, you know, that type of thing. Um, actually, Jody's company uh, that was just talking previously, they went through uh, this process as well. And uh, you can certainly talk with them and get their thoughts on what, you know, how helpful that uh, was for them in terms of uh, moving the ball forward. Um, all these steps, uh, individually or conjunction or some combination thereof, uh, will help shorten the time to get you from here to there. Um, failing all that, you can still obviously go through this uh, on your own, and uh, and that's fine. But you know, please, uh, like I said previously, you know, contact CSI staff or the auditors to you know make sure you get all the supporting materials in place and uh, you know get some insights uh, early on in the process to get the ball rolling. So. Here at this point, you want to ensure that you obtain and review all the supporting and prep materials. Just briefly, um, supporting and preparation materials would include the CSIA best practices itself, that document, which you know currently there's version 4 out there. Version 5 is in the wings. So depending on your timing, you might be looking at one or the other. Uh, there's a certification management system manual that's uh, available to review on site about the, you know, the whole process of how the certification system is managed. Uh, there's the certification application itself. There's an audit preparation guide, which basically outlines a lot of the steps that we're talking about here. Um, there's an audit prep spreadsheet and work breakdowns uh, structure that uh, provides guidance for you know, basically giving you some building blocks to step through the audit preparation process. There's a copy of the audit report itself that uh, you should uh, obtain. Uh, you know, that contains the specific questions that uh, we go through as part of the audit. Um, all of these things can be obtained from the CSIA website. You know, if you go into the resource library and then down into the best practices and certification for members only, you'll find this information in there. If you have any challenges navigating that website or finding this, you know, please just give uh, Kim a call at CSIA or call up the auditors and we can certainly uh, help you out with uh, any of those items. So you know, you've got all this stuff in front of you. Where do I start? You know, a key thing here is ensure you've got internal leadership in place to drive the process forward. Very critical. Also critical, set this initiative up as a project. Run it like a project, which means making a plan, build the team, delegate tasks and responsibilities, set a budget and schedule, track and control the progress. Um, very important. You know, one of the challenges some companies have if they don't do this, it ends up being a process that they try and get done during the commercial breaks. And you know that's the sort of situation where we'll often see a company you know take years to get ready before they're uh, you know in a point to, to do an audit. So definitely set it up as a project, move it forward. Also critically important is perform a self audit uh, early on in the process. You probably want to do that more than once uh, during this process, but perform that self audit, identify the gaps, and be sure that there's evidence of compliance in place with these best practices, and that it's there and it's readily accessible. Uh, and assume nothing. And you know, importantly, beware of the tribal knowledge aspect. It's really easy when you're going through it to say, "Oh yeah, we've got this. We know all about this. That oh, we're good." But there's no evidence to support that, or we're lacking the policies and procedures to, uh, you know, support that uh, these are requirements and things like that. So um, make sure you do a, a proper self audit and use the audit report as a as a tool to uh, drive that process. Once you do that, make all the necessary adjustments based on your findings and uh, move forward from there. One of the other areas that uh, are important here, of course, is documenting your policies and procedures. Um, we certainly recommend that the earlier you start, the easier it is. As the company grows, uh, things only get more complex. Establish a framework for defining your processes. You know, standardize on a format for your SOPs. Uh, document what you do now, not some what you're going to do in the future, or some ideal of what you think the best practice is. But start with what uh, with, with, with where you're at now. Um, keep it simple, but don't be aware of oversimplification. Um, ensure that the SOPs are consistent with what you're actually doing. 
and ensure that they're consistent with the intent of the best practice. You know, those, those items are key. Um, and if you're uncertain about the intent of the best practice, you know, give us a call. Um, it's uh, certainly not a problem to, uh, you know, provide a, uh, a clarification if, uh, if you've got a question along the way. Um, and as you move this forward, ensure that there's going to be some sort of framework or mechanism to uh, guide you improving your processes as, as you move forward. Because whatever you put out there, you know, coming out of the gates, you know, there's a good chance that it may not be perfect. So, you know, there needs to be a mechanism for, for improving it along the way as, as, as you move forward and uh, go forward from there. So once you go back and look at all these things, you've got it in place, you've done your self-audits, you think you're ready for an audit, then if you can call, say, hey, look, we're ready, schedule, schedule it with the, uh, you know, submit your certification application to CSIA and the, and the corresponding fee, schedule an audit with the auditor, uh, include a service agreement with the auditor, and perform an audit. These are, this is, in a nutshell, uh, all the basic steps to uh, you know, get up to that point of uh, getting ready for an audit. A um, couple other things I just want to briefly touch on, other CSIA resources that are available there, is that if you go into the section on the website, resources for managing your integration business, there are some items in there that can be very helpful in the development number of aspects of best practices. There are some templates, not for all aspects of best practices, but there are some items in there related to configuration management, some project management templates, uh, terms and condition samples, uh, some, uh, some uh, links and articles with regards to cybersecurity. You know, these are resources that are already there and available for you to review, adapt, uh, and provide additional insights as to Know, what you want to have in place uh, for your own as you develop your own processes along the way. Uh, one of the things that we do find is not all integrators are always aware that these tools uh, are there for, for, for their use and, uh, internally within the company. Um, and uh, that, that's about it in a nutshell. If you've got questions on any of this stuff along the way, you know, please feel free to give us a call and we'll be happy to uh, elaborate in, in more detail. Thank you very much, Brian. Again, if, if anyone has questions for any of our panelists, um, you know, we'll, we'll certainly take those at the end. You're welcome to type them into the Q&A feature. So the next question that we get quite often is, how does CSI certification audit compare to ISO? Um, Gordon, would you be willing to comment on that? Yeah, Gordon Cox with ASR, you know, we quite often get that question, how does it compare? So we can do some compare and contrast between the two standards. <clears throat> right now, there's a great deal of similarity between the two standards. Uh, the ISO standard is an international standard, and the CSIA standard is a standard that was developed through CSIA. Um, each one of the standards has a three-year time frame that they deal with. With CSIA, you go through a uh, initial certification. Uh, there's a three-year period, and then there's a recertification. Uh, with the ISO standard, it's a three-year standard. But what's required is, in the interim, there's either a one-year surveillance audit or twice a year surveillance audit. So, you know, what you have is this ongoing review of a quality system management system that's been put in place. Uh, the questions that relate to the two standards, again, today are very similar. Uh, there's been um, uh, spreadsheets put together that compare the questions that would be on an ISO audit and a CSIA audit and show where the relationships are between the two standards. Uh, the, the other issues are that on the ISO standard, it's a pass-fail process. Uh, either the, uh, the company or the organization fully addresses the requirement of a particular clause or element of a standard. And if they don't, then our only uh, resolve is to request corrective action on their part. On the CSIA audit, uh, the, the audit is scored on a zero through five process. 
zero is meaning that there's absolutely no indication or evidence that something has been initiated and five saying that it's almost best practice or world practice you know that a company has established that to put in place again uh, the um, the whole process again is very similar in nature and I think the two standards again are complementary. We have a number of clients right now that are both CSIA as well as ISO 9000 certified. In my experience is when we're going through a recertification audit to the two standards at during the same period, if I go through and do the ISO uh, standard first, you know, I've already answered some of the questions for CSIA. And also, if we do the CSIA standard first, we've answered some of the questions for the ISO audit process. So, you know, again, I think there's not a big leap for a company that would wish to go either that is currently ISO 9000 certified to go to CSIA or CSIA to go to ISO 9000. There's a lot of companies that have done both, and I think that, um, you know, depending upon your marketplace and what your customers are demanding, uh, that is very complementary to the processes that you want to put in place. Uh, as I said before, um, you know, the longevity of the standard is very um, is very beneficial. So the ISO standards have been around for a number of years. It initially was developed in Europe and brought to the United States. Uh, European companies, there are more companies that demand the ISO certification than they do in the United States. But the, what's happened is that there's branches of the, uh, of the ISO standard that's gone into automotive, for example, um, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, different things. So all the issues that are addressed in the ISO requirement are addressed in the CSI standard. However, there are some issues in the CSI standard that are not currently addressed in the ISO standard, one of them being the financial management, and the other one is uh, cybersecurity. Uh, I just finished doing cross comparison between the two, and those two really, uh, really showed up. Uh, the ISO requirements have fully addressed uh, the risk analysis that had been in place for the CSIA for a number of years. I'm glad to see that that finally has been moved into that. So, I, again, I think that, you know, the, comparing the two, the, the audit requirements are very different in nature, but yet very similar in parallel, depending upon how you look at it. Um, you know, we have to look at, I think, that um, um, the certification bodies need to go back or have looked at how these processes are accomplished and control these aspects to make sure that we keep uh, a modern approach to this whole requirement. Uh, one of the things I'd like to see maybe potentially is if we could go back and um, uh, maybe potentially have some type of um, midterm surveillance aspects for the uh, CSIA audit, you know, not necessarily an on-site audit, but somehow having some kind of a, a review process that's done midterm just to make sure that everybody's still complying with the established requirements that have been put forth through the standard. So uh, again, um, the two standards as far as the audit process is very similar in nature and yet somewhat dynamic uh, as opposed to each other just because of the nature of the two but you know they're both again as I said a three-year process um, one of them requires that there be surveillance audits in the midterm and the other one does not so I think that again um, they're both very uh, comprehensive standards, and I think any company that goes through the process to become CSIA certified will find that they come out the back end a lot better company, more profitable, and, and you know, the customer aspects that they achieved will be more beneficial to their operation as well as their customer support. So if you Thank want to you want to have any additional questions, ask in the end. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gordon. 
Um, we often get asked about the audit experience, um, duration, technical requirements, um, things of that nature, and also how the audit is performed and scored. Don, would you comment on those, those topics? Yeah, sure. So Tom was going to handle this, so I won't even attempt an Australian accent. But <clears throat> So Gordon kind of alluded to it. The audit takes uh, two days. We're on site at your facility for two days. And we usually start off with an introductory meeting. At the introductory meeting, we have uh, all of the key com key players for the audit are going to attend that meeting. And we just kind of introduce the topic and, and the tools that are going to be used. The introductory meetings usually followed up then with a, a quick tour. Now I really like the tour component to it because it gives me um, the ability to take, kind of get a sense of what the culture of the company is. So keep in mind that when we're touring around, we're, we're looking at things that you may not think we're looking at. You know, just trying to see uh, how are people working, uh, are things posted up on the wall that we would expect to see, and things of that nature. The other thing that's nice about the tour is it usually gives the member company um, a little bit of a time to get comfortable with the auditor. So we're we're chatting and, and just sort of getting getting acquainted, if you will. We'll come back to the tour um, during the audit. We, we're going to go through the audit report questions, question by question. Start at the, the first question, go from chapter one, all going all the way through to the end. There's somewhere between 75 and 80 questions, depending on the version uh, of the audit that uh, you're at. Uh, I mentioned that version four is the current version, version five is coming up. It's um, best to have the person that's responsible for the individual areas present uh, in person during their session, their section of the audit. So if you have somebody who does your financials, if it's somebody external, see if you can get them to come in for that portion of it, uh, similar for HR or, or project management. But they don't necessarily need to be there for the entire two days. So they might sit in only in their section. If they sit through the whole, the whole period, that's fine, but it's not, uh, not a requirement. The auditor is going to set the pace for the audit. So, you know, we'll pull together an agenda. Uh, we'll work with the, the company to kind of have an agenda. But the auditor is going to set the pace. And some of that is going to be based on what they're finding. So uh, you might, you know, I know in a lot of the audits I do, the very first question might, might take an hour and a half. And you think, oh my goodness, we got 80 questions. Are we really going to get through this? But a lot of that is to try and get to know the company and uh, get a certain level of uh, comfort. Uh, keep in mind the auditors have lots and lots of uh, experience at doing audits. So the easiest and the fastest way to get through an audit is to be totally open and honest. If you try to hide things, uh, that just generally slows things down, doesn't really change the score or anything um, because we've got a lot of experience knowing which rock to uh, look under to uh, find the real results. Um, some companies prefer that when we do the audit that we actually provide them with lots of feedback. So it's more of an interactive session. We ask the question, um, we get their input, they ask questions of us, and uh, I, I, I like those kinds of audits. I strongly encourage it. Uh, as I said, all of the auditors have seen lots and lots of different companies, so we've got some experience to, uh, to, to go through. We'll go through the uh, entire audit asking uh, all of the questions. Uh, at a few points, you might find the auditor saying, OK, I, I just want to go out and validate some of this with the rest of the staff. So they'll go out and maybe talk to an engineer about their experience on uh, delivering a project or a project manager uh, on how they manage projects, or maybe your accounts receivable clerk on, uh, on managing that side. So there, there may be times when the auditors are just checking and validating that what they're hearing in the processes that they've seen actually be uh, implemented. At the end of the audit, the auditor will take a little bit of time to summarize and finalize the audit results. And then they actually print out two copies of the audit right, right at your site. And uh, the whoever is responsible on the company side signs off on it. The auditor signs off on it. Um, and the company keeps a, a signed copy of the audit results. And the auditor also keeps a, a copy of the audit results. 
All of this is electronic, of course, so uh, we, the auditor is going to scan in that audit result and send a copy of that off to CSI. In the past, in the previous audits, there was only a cover sheet that was sent to CSA, but now the entire audit report goes back um, to CSA. So we've, we've finished the audit, we've printed the audit reports, we've signed the audits, and, and now what there is is a, a, a close-up meeting. So we uh, sit down with members of the company, and this varies company by company. Some companies will only have a few people sit in the wrap-up session. Some companies will have all of the people who have all the audits sit in, and some companies will open it up even beyond that. Um, and we'll go through the audit results. Uh, we usually spend time focusing on things that uh, where the company has done exceptionally well, um, and we'd like to you know, uh, congratulate them on that. For areas where we think that um, some additional work is necessary, some improvement should be made. During the audit, we're uh, looking for evidence. So there's a question here, are uh, written documents and SOPs required for every item and subject? Not necessarily for every single one of them. And as you read through the best practices, you'll see keywords that clue you into it, sort of like there's a written, should have a written mission statement, written procedure for this. Uh, so a good number of them are going to require the written policies or procedures, but, but not necessarily. We are, though, going to look for evidence, and I think Brian Penny alluded to this, of the policies, procedures, records, whatever it is that that, that particular best practice item talks to, um, and we're going to uh, dig into that in a little bit. Nowadays, typically, that's done online. So if somebody pulls up a screen, shows us uh, either a SharePoint site or file uh, structure or something to, to show that. Uh, in the early audits, it was all print out documents, and, and we'd walk into a room full of uh, binders of documents. But nowadays, it's pretty much um, everybody's done, uh, done in there. Then in advance, uh, on a uh, a ship once or something like that. Now, I, I will caution you, though, uh, if you do print things out or you do say, move everything into this special folder called CSI audit, uh, keep in mind that that's great. It ha it's helpful. It makes things a little bit more efficient. But we are going to look beyond that. So uh, you know, for instance, you have a policy that says we do a factor acceptance test on every project. We're going to look at a random sampling of uh, projects to see yeah, that actually does exist. I want to add just a couple more points to the experience of uh, going through an audit. Don't be afraid or intimidated. Jody mentioned, you know, it is it is kind of a stressful environment, but we're there as auditors. We're there to help you build your company, uh, not to be uh, unnecessarily critical. So we're happy to provide you with advice and things of that nature. Take advantage of that skill set that's sitting across the table from you to learn as much as you can. Um, I'm going to add just one little point for any of the people online that may be from uh, other countries. The language of the audit is English. So in some cases, in some countries, we do the entire audit through an interpreter. And I've done that for lots of times. So I, think I can tell you it's a pretty interesting experience. I want to move now into the scoring, um, how we actually end up with you know, the audit report. I'm going to a couple of points. All companies get asked exactly the same questions. The questions are known in advance. You can look at the uh, audit report. The, the questions are flagged in the best practices document, and the, the audit report only lists those questions that we're, we're going to audit. All companies, independent of their size, independent of where in the world they're located, get asked uh, the same questions and are scored using the same scoring system, which I'll, I'll talk to you here in a little bit. Mentioned uh, just in the previous session that we ask each question starting from chapter one and going through chapter nine. Uh, in a, a couple of situations, it may be that you know, somebody's not available for say finance, and we might have to shift that chapter around. So we, we can do a little bit of that. But the audit report is structured much like the flow of the business. We like to try and start from chapter one and go through through uh, chapter nine or ten, depending on which audit you're doing. Uh, I mentioned I prefer these to be more of a discussion than a one-way transfer of information. There's a lot of information uh, sitting across the ta table from you, so uh, sharing that experience. So let me get into the scoring. 
Gordon touched on this a little bit. Unlike ISO where it's, it's conform, non-conform, in CSIA we score from zero to five. Zero is basically, oh, I never thought of that before. You'd probably get that zero. Uh, two kind of indicates that things are partially implemented, um, may or may not be a common practice. Three is you follow the best practices. It's fairly well implemented uh, and fairly well uh, uh, incorporated into the culture of the company. Four is a well thought out. It exceeds best practices and is completely rolled out across the company. And five, as Gordon alluded to, is really world class. It's, a, it's whatever you're doing it exceeds best practices. There's good evidence of continuous improvement. So we're, you're going to get a score on each question. From zero to five. Again, every company goes through that same scoring. Um, and that scoring information then just gets recorded on the audit report. All of that scoring information then um, is totaled up through, through the audit report. And uh, at the end of the audit, we have a pretty good idea. We have a, 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 an idea of exactly what, you, uh, what your score is. Now, because all companies are asked exactly the same questions and scored exactly the same way, how do we differentiate between a little company and a big company? So the audit is set up identifying three different company sizes, a small company, a mid-sized company, and a large company. And we, uh, the score that we, uh, the score that's ideal for that company is dependent on that size. So think of it from the perspective of that there's your score, there's an idea score. So for a small company, for instance, it may be that in something like succession planning or, or leadership changes, the small just starting up, they don't really need to spend so much time on that. So if, you're, if you've got a score of two, that would probably be best for your size of company. But if it was a large company, they would probably have to clearly understand and maybe even be able to demonstrate that they've actually, um, actually implemented some management changes. Each question scored independently. We don't look at uh, how they all tie together. Uh, there are a couple questions that do ask the same question in different parts of the company, but they're all scored uh, independently. And the, the Brian, I think, alluded to this. What we're really doing is we're comparing it to the best practices. So how well does your procedure align with what the best practices are? Scores are totaled at the end of the audit um, compared to the requirements for certification. Uh, to get certified, the company needs a total score that meets or exceeds the requirement for their company size, but they also need to get a score that meets or exceeds the requirements for the score in chapters of finance, project management, project delivery, and supporting activities. Now, that's a lot of information around the scoring, um, and I encourage you to get an audit report and look at it. All of this stuff is in the audit report, including how we score. Um, get the audit report, play with it for a while, just put your numbers in and see how that, that works. A uh, couple little quick notes. One of them is if a company scores two or more below the ideal score, then the auditor is going to make a note of that on the audit report um, and expect to see next time he shows up some improvements on that. And then the other one that I touched on a little bit earlier, the entire audit report is sent off to CSIA uh, at the end of the audit. CSIA then takes a look at that audit report and determines whether or not the the member has met the requirements for certification. The auditor has got the scoring, in, but there are other things such as did you pay your dues, have you, have you filed something that um, CSI needs to make sure is covered off before they can issue certification. So that uh, that pretty much covers the audit experience and the scoring. Uh, give me from you, Bill. Thank you very much, Don. Um, as we are, as we know, the, the new best practices and benchmarks manual version five will be coming out soon. And one item that is, is of interest is what? How will it be different? What changes will there be in the new version? Um, Eric, could you comment on that? Certainly, but I'd first like to kind of echo a couple of things that I thought you know since we've been going through the process that you know, what Brian said was getting an early start and planning, but two of the best uh, 
value add that CSIA has brought to us was, you know, the networking and just being able to talk to someone else, uh, maybe a non-competitor that is willing to talk through their experiences and, you know, just share with you the practices, uh, the best practices. I mean, we've got the manual, but um, the lessons learned that they've gone through uh, are very helpful. And there's just a wealth of people that are willing to share that. So make sure you, you capitalize on that if you're thinking about going through the certification process. And the other one is the manual itself. So uh, I think Ryan mentioned it as well to kind of get a copy of that, walk through it uh, in, in its entirety, get the copy of the audit, and just walk through it yourself and see where you think you lie, uh, uh, where you end up, and then start working on the things that are most important to your business uh, first. Because that's truly the value you get out of the certification is um, bettering your business and shoring up your risk and doing things in a more consistent man manner that uh, Jody pointed out. All right, that's, that's my soapbox. Um, but as far as version 5, uh, there's some pilot audits going on and uh, the auditors here on the call are going through it and giving us some good feedback and uh, you know, we've got a few updates to make. but. Uh, you know, the target for getting this thing out to the general general release is, is still on target, so it's looking good. As far as what's changed, uh, we, first and foremost, we tried to make this uh, where we took the areas that needed clarification or additional material, we tried to add material everywhere within the manual to kind of make it clear, a uh, better understanding of what the requirements and best practices are. But we added some new sections on information systems management and cybersecurity, uh, a couple of subsections to cover environmental responsibility and sustainability, as, w as well as health and wellness and safety. Uh, a lot of that material was there in different sections. We tried to just group that together to kind of uh, include a focus there. Um, the other part of it is because of our membership, we tried to make sure that we've gone through the entire manual and make sure that it had global relevance. Uh, so if there is a requirement in, you know, for taxes in the U.S., we tried to make sure that we covered other territories and other countries as well. Um, and, you know, that will be an ever-changing uh, process, but we tried to make that a little more uh, significant this time. And then we tried to reorganize. Uh, there were some clar clarifications in certain areas, and, and I know we still got some areas to, to improve upon, but where we tried to cover off in different sections or we might have covered off risk management in a couple of different sections. So we try to consolidate those and bring those together. Um, uh, kind of the, you know, make a plug for getting your information. If you've gone through the manual or you've gone through the certification process or you've at least reviewed it and you're prepping for it, give us some feedback. Feel free to give Kim a, an email or myself an email and say, hey, I, I really think this area needs work. Uh, We've got a task force and a committee to go uh, continually improve this, this manual. And like I said, I think it's one of the best things that this organization brings to its members is this you know, combined knowledge that uh, many groups before us have put together and you know, we're just trying to make better. Um, so there's a lot of years of experience in, the, in between the, the front and back cover. Um, and I guess there's a couple of committee members on here. I'll just, if there's anything I missed, uh, feel free to add as far as uh, what's changed. I mean, some of the auditors might have a better input, but I know we want to give time for questions. Uh, anything else? Um, Eric, I just, a question came up. Um, when will we be able to see version 5 of the manual? Right now we're targeting, uh, we've got to incorporate the feedback from the audits. Um, right now we're trying to make sure that we've, we've got it released uh, uh, for general release before the executive conference. I think we're still on track for that. Um, I have to double check, so I don't want to, anybody to hold me to that. I know this is being recorded, so rewind that, but uh, that's the target, um, is to try and get that out and make sure it's available uh, prior to that. Certainly if there's someone that's considering a pilot, um, you know, we don't have it out for general release, but you know, a request to take a look at it if you're considering it, uh, we can certainly make that if there's a if that if you meet the qualifications, uh, pre, you know it's not your first audit, that kind of thing. Uh, if you need it right away. Perfect. Thank you, Eric. Um, so yes, at this point we will open it up for any questions from um, webinar participants. I am seeing a, a couple come in here. 
bear with me here. I'll jump. I'll jump in and answer one of the questions. It's uh, what's the definition of small, medium, and large companies? Yeah, um, and I kind of, I kind of skipped through that because I think we're going to try and tweak that up a little bit on the next uh, version of the audit. But um, right now, the way it's established is anything under three million is a small company. Three to seven million is a large company, and seven and greater or three to seven is a mid-size, seven and greater is large. Now, one of the things that we do have to do is we have to translate um, a lot of times uh, foreign companies into a into a U.S. currency. So, it, you know, it's quite feasible that in India you could be a, a $2 million company and have uh, over 100 employees. Well, so we'll take the number of employees into consideration and um, use that as part of our decision-making process too. That's something we get established in, a, in advance with the uh, auditor. Thank you. Are there any other questions out there? If so, feel free to submit them through the Q&A. Or panelists, do you have anything else you'd like to add to today's discussion? The only thing I'll add um, is, I think there's one question out there I'm not sure we fully answered, is that I don't believe the auditors collect any evidence beforehand. Uh, it's, you know, you as a as a member company or preparation for your audit, you're collecting it, but I think as Don mentioned, um, it's best to kind of know where it is, but leave it in its native location. Uh, that way they can, you know, you're not uh, uh, pulling together the best of the best and, and they will look other places, but uh, it's best to kind of keep it where, where you keep it now and just go to that location and show the auditor that here's our sign off on our factor acceptance test. Um, and and I'd, I'd like to expand on that a little bit. This is Jody again. Um, we, we created an evidence spreadsheet based upon the best practices and the section numbers, and then we had evidence um, for each of those sections that um, could hot link to our folder structure or, or wherever these documents lived. And it helped out tremendously in pre-organization and when the audit process was happening. Yeah, Jody, that's a good uh, that's a good idea. There is a document that is available that is an uh, uh, audit prep uh, document that helps set some of that sort of stuff up. And I agree with Jody is if you use that uh, and define who's responsible for coming up with the evidence and where is that evidence going to be housed, uh, that'll that'll streamline streamline things a lot. Wonderful. Ken, you touch on um, a company's options, um, a company that's looking at being audited in the next few months with version 5 coming out, um, getting a couple of questions about do we audit to version 4 or version 5 of the best practices? I'll take the first stab of it. I think there are others that might also add to it. So there's certain requirements. This can't be your first audit. There's certain qualifications to, to do a pilot audit, and one of them is that you've had to have previously passed uh, or previously been certified so that you're not hitting it the first time. Um, and then certainly it's timing uh, to be considered a pilot. We're trying to get the release out. So um, since we're already mid-January, if you're not already in that process, it probably uh, uh, won't be considered a pilot unless we need to extend it for some reason. And then lastly, I uh, believe there's a time frame, I can't remember if it's six months, but uh, after it's open for general release, you still have the option if you started the prep to stay with version four, but then there's a hard deadline and we'll publish that when we get the, um, get the general release out that says you must do version five. So um, the auditors may be able to clarify some of those requirements or Kim. Yeah, that's uh, this is Brian. That 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 that's accurate, uh, uh, Eric. It's typically what we've done in the past. So when the uh, actual formal release gets out there, um, you know whatever you know actual date that is, typically there's been about a six month window uh, going forward from there. So everyone will know you know well ahead of time that hey you know this is the window you've got to do it. So if your due date or if you're looking to uh, audit in that time frame, and you've, you've got your choice, and uh, that seems to have worked uh, pretty well in the past. 
Yeah, to further amplify what Don talked about, the different size of companies, one of the distinct differences that the ISO standard looks at is the employee count of a company. So the, the more employees that are there, the required mandates are increased. The other issue, too, is if a company is design responsible. So, you know, the CSIA does not take a look at the size, the physical uh, size of a company, other than the fact that you may have, uh, you know, different locations. But, for example, we have clients that uh, are as small as 10 employees, but yet they're still certified. And because we don't look at the different size of revenue, that has nothing to do with it. And we also have companies that have, you know, thousands of employees. So from that standpoint, the audit requirements may be weeks instead of just days. Okay, well, I want to thank you all again um, for your time today um, we are we will need to, unless there are any more questions or comments um, just wanted to pass along a couple of reminders um, as the panelists have touched on um, companies that are ready to certify or renew their certification the first step is to um, complete and return the certification application form and that document along with the best practices manual and uh, many of our audit preparation resources that um, were mentioned today are available for download from our website, controlsys.org, in the library called Best Practices and Certification Members Only. <clears throat> we do have our conference coming up in April. Um, encourage everyone to, to register and consider uh, attendance. The, also, the Best Practices Workshop will be held on April 23rd and 24th, immediately preceding the conference. Um, if you are considering certification, certainly encourage you to um, think about attending that workshop as well. More information about the workshop and the conference can be found online. Just go to our website, controlsys.org, and you'll see a link to the conference site. So again, I just want to thank everyone for participating today. A special thanks to our panelists for their time, um, and again, to Software Toolbox. Um, if you have any questions or anything um, you'd like to follow up on, please do not hesitate to contact me. I have my contact information up on the screen. Um, thank you again, and have a wonderful day.